want you to look at this cross. This, this cross is covered with prayer requests, uh, desired miracles, uh, areas that we need to surrender the Lord so that we can have those miracles, and hopefully and confidently uh, some miracles that we want to see in other people, not just about ourselves, right? Amen? Over here, last Sunday, we put uh, a basket out to uh, collect the cards of those who've already had answers to prayer and where God showed up and to say thank you. Um, but I want you to notice, do you see in this spotlight that there are four cards that are in blue? That's symbolic. All these other cards are miracles that have happened in our past. But these four cards are answers to prayer directly from the miracles on that cross that we've had in the last two weeks. Yeah, you bet. One of them, uh, now some are answers to prayer. So you can, you can uh, determine in your own heart whether this is a miracle or not. Some, some were requesting miracles, some are just requesting for answers to prayer. But one of the blue cards... That was, that was a request over here two weeks ago, was from Ron and Sarah Willard, and said, uh, we prayed for our son Trey, who is a student at Virginia Tech, to seek the Lord. Um, he's, uh, you know, Tech secular school, and, and they were kind of worried about his spiritual development, a little anxious about it. Uh, Thursday night, uh, he sent Sarah, or sent me, a picture, a snapshot, saying he was on campus at a Bible study this past week. So they made the request, worried about their son in a secular university, continuing to seek the Lord. The very next week, he goes to a Bible study. He met a girl, and he took her there too. Then she says, whatever it takes. <laughs> God shows up in weird ways, amen? So anyway, that's one of the blue cards. At the end of the service, I'm going to invite any and all of you, some of you that already had cards up here, I'm going to invite you just to come for a season of prayer at the end of the service because all miracles come after prayer. There are others of you who haven't had a chance to put your request up here. And if you'd like, if you, there's a miracle that you need, I invite you to take one of those white cards and write it out. Get it ready now for the end of the service. Write it at the top. Underneath that, write one thing you need to give the Lord. If you're going to have that miracle, what do you need to surrender the Lord? And the last thing is to write a miracle that somebody else needs. Because it's not just about us. Amen? Can I get a witness on that? And I'm going to give you an opportunity to, get, to bring it. And you can join those that are praying, or you can go back to your seat. This, this cross is covered, as I mentioned earlier, with miracles that have already happened. People that wanted to give God praise for what they've already done. If there's something in your past where God saved your bacon, then I invite you to take a white card, a white one, and write that answer to prayer out and bring it to the basket. If you're here this morning and you had a miracle on that cross and you've had an answer in the last two weeks, then in your chair there is a blue card. Use the blue one. If you've had a recent answer to prayer, the card of the miracle request is on that cross. Bring that answer to this bucket on a blue card because I want us to be able to glance at this cross next Sunday and see that our God isn't just the God of the past. Can I get a witness on that? That he is alive and well and he's working in people's lives right now. We believe that God still answers prayer, right? Not just in the yesterdays. He's, in, he's working in our hearts and lives right now. If you have a current answer to prayer, 
I want you to bring it in a blue card and put it at the end of the service. Are we good? Amen? Got Matthew chapter, I mean Mark chapter 8. I can already tell you're going to have to really listen careful. I'm just going to bless you as you listen to this frog for the next 30 minutes. Mark chapter 8, verse 8, we find these words. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces. Note that. That's really important. That were left over. Up in verse 9, about 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, verse 10, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. Moving from the monotonous to the miraculous. Learning to live in miracle territory. Let's pray. (coughs) Lord Jesus, only you and your infinite knowledge and love of these people in this room know who needs a miracle. We believe that you are still in the miracle-making business. And we want to be a part of it. We want to be the kind of people you can work miracles through. We don't want to hinder the flow of your Holy Spirit through us. We don't have everything figured out. We don't always understand why you say yes sometimes and no on other times. But, Father, we don't have to be totally ignorant about how miracles work. So help us to learn what we can learn because we want to live in miracle territory. In Jesus' name, everybody said. We've learned already two weeks ago that all miracles begin with what? The problem. We learned two weeks ago that all miracles work through what? We learned two weeks ago that all miracles come after what? Which is what we're going to do at the end of the service today. Last week we learned we might not have the power to do a miracle. We can be a part of one, but we can't initiate it. But we did learn that we can stop one. We have the power to stop a miracle God wants to work in your life. And we talked about the fact that if the disciples hadn't been willing to give up what was in their hand, They could have stopped the miracle right there. If they weren't willing to surrender to the Lord those few pieces of bread and few uh, pieces of fish, they could have stopped the miracle right there. We learn that if, if you're not willing to give out what's in your hand, if you're not willing to share it, what if they would have taken what Lord blessed and ate it all? They could have stopped the miracle right there. But instead, they gave it out. They gave it away. And as they were giving it away, The miracle happened. Didn't happen until they gave it away. We can stop what God wants to do in your life if we get selfish and not share what God has put in our hand. Can I get a witness on that? We learned last week we can stop the miracle if we're not willing to to receive in what God has for us. If the people hadn't sat down and ate and eaten They could have stopped the miracle right there. And we talked about many reasons why sometimes we don't want to receive what God wants to give us. We might not be able to do a miracle, you know, by the snap of our finger. But we can stop one. If we're not willing to learn to live in miracle territory. Are you with me? This morning is an absolutely huge lesson. I want to talk about what should happen after a God-given miracle takes place. That's what's going on in the second half of verse 8 all the way through verse 10. It teaches us what should happen after God gives a miracle in your life. Number one, write this down. Don't be afraid... Number one, to measure the miracle. Write that down. Don't be afraid to measure the miracle. The second part of verse 8, look at these words. Afterward. See that? 
afterward, after the miracle happened, the disciples picked up what? Seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Something that, that's kind of an inside thing. You had to do a little bit of research to find it. But you know, it, it's easy to look at the feeding of the 4,000 as a secondary miracle compared to the 5,000. But we already talked about and, and heard the stakes were much higher when they were feeding the 4,000 because they were in a much more remote place. They were three days removed from any civilization. The stakes were high. And another thing that's different, even though there were 12 basketfuls that they cre- collected at, at the end of the 5,000, those were small doggy bag baskets. These baskets are storage baskets. Three or four or five times bigger than those doggy bag baskets that they use for the 5,000. The question I have is, why gather the food? Why gather the food in the first place? Are they going to give it to the poor? Problem is, there aren't any poor. They're in a remote place. There isn't anybody out there. They're going to save it and eat leftovers? Maybe. But we're going to find in a couple of weeks, maybe it's even next week, that they're going to have a big argument here in a a couple of verses. You know why? Because they don't have enough bread. Can you imagine arguing over not having enough bread when you just saw the master feed 4,000 people with just a few crumbs? So why, why count it in the first place? You know what I think they're doing? I think they're measuring the miracle. I think they're confirming that the miracle took place to begin with. You know what I'm convinced for some of us? I'm convinced for some of us that God has worked some pretty significant miracles or, or, or interventions in your life, and you didn't even take time to even notice that he did it. Getting a little worked up. I've got to stay down here a little bit so my voice doesn't go away. You ever hear me make a statement, the truth never fears investigation? How many times do you hear me say that? The truth never fears investigation. Sometimes I think we wonder if we, in, if we investigate this thing too much, we'll find out oh, it wasn't God that did it. It was some smart doctor. Or it was just chance. You know what I've found in my life? God wants to give us the kind of results that point to him and only to him and give him glory. Don't be afraid to examine the miracle. You've heard me tell you and share on many occasions about that that Greek test in seminary that I was so afraid of, you know, and how I hated Greek, and I had to take several semesters of Greek, and I was up to my last test. I was this close to getting past Greek. I'm never going to visit Greek in the rest of my life, and if I could just pass this last test, and it was a, like a four-page test, took about four hours to take it, and, and uh, the prof said at the end that uh, uh, we should come back and within the week after we get our grade, and we can retrieve our test, and we can ask any questions that we have about it, and the test was, the results, the grade was going to show up in our mailbox. And you've heard me tell you about going to the mailbox, and um, you know, unexpectedly, I open it up, and there's there's the grade, and I almost lose my breath. I think I stood there. I think my heart stopped there for a couple minutes. And I pulled that thing out, and, and I didn't want to open it up in front of, you know, everybody in that very public place. I didn't want them to see me cry if I flunked that class. And I didn't want them to see me, you know, have a party if I, you know, if I got anything other than an F, you know what I mean? And so I took it off to my car, and a uh, very, very quiet place. And you remember me uh, telling you about tearing off the tabs. You, you know those things where they come in the mail and they got tabs. You got to tear them off on all four sides. I got them all t- uh, tore off, and I have a little prayer. Ask God, please change this F to a D minus. Do anything to get me af- out of this Greek stuff. And I, I tear this. I'm not speaking evangelistically. I'm not embellishing this. I, I open it notch by notch. You know how they got these little notches? You got to pull it, and I get to the last notch. And I close my eyes. And I pull that notch off. I know, as my eyes closed, I know my grade is right in front of me. I'm not kidding you. It's exactly how I did it. And I open my eyes. 
and I got a B plus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I tell you, I think I could hear the angels sing. I think I heard him just then. One of my best friends, still to this day, a very near and dear friend, Dave Tolan. He goes, yeah, something like that. Um, I ran into him. He said, hey, did you hear? The test results are back. The test results. And he got a little nervous, and he asked, what you get? And I said, I got a B plus. And, and I could see David. I could read him like a book. He got elated. And I know what he's thinking. He said, if John Ock got a B plus, then I must have got an A, you know? <laughs> And so he can't wait. Come on, let's And he almost runs to the post office to open up his little box and pull out his A, you know. And he opens it up, and he looks at it. You know what he got? A C minus. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> that wasn't right. I shouldn't have rejoiced over that last one. But I'll confess enough carnality that I did enjoy that one, too. At that thought, I, I remember what the prof said, that if, if you go back up to the class, you can retrieve your exam. Within, he'd give you about a week. And if you don't get up there after a week, he's going to throw it away. So I headed for the steps, right? If you remember the story, I had this terrible thought. What if it's a bad mistake? What if I get up there and the test is an F? What if there was just, you know, a mix-up in paper? I get up there and I look at my test. Now I have a terrible moral dilemma. I'd have to decide if I'm going to tell the prophet he made a mistake. Or I can just keep my mouth shut and be free of Greek for the rest of my life. And then I thought, you know, I don't have to go at all. Forget this. I'm out of here. Never went back and got that test because I was afraid to examine the evidence. Sometimes we treat God that way. Sometimes we're afraid if we examine the evidence, we'll find out the truth that he really didn't do what he said he did or we think that he did. Listen to me. Here, here's the crutch of it. If you do that, you know what you're going to do? You're going to rob yourself of a better understanding of what your God can do for you. And that's going to affect your faith. And that's going to affect your trust. And that's going to affect your confidence for the giants that are facing you in the future. If God does something great, you need to examine the evidence because he wants to expand your trust and faith in what he can do if you step out of your comfort zone with him. Does that make sense to you? God can do more than you think he can. And you can discover that if you take time to measure what he's already done. Write this down. The second thing that happens after the miracle is they take time to marvel over the miracle. Not only do they gather the food, the second thing they do is they count the people. And that kind of blesses my heart because my staff is always on me about being too numbers conscious. And you, those of you who know me know that I love a big crowd and I can't, I can't wait to fill this place out. In fact, one of my miracles that's on this cross right here is I'm praying that this year the Lord will give 100 new people to this service. That would mean that with this service right here would break 400 within the next few months. If that happens, that's a bona fide revival miracle. We would have never grown that fast. And guys, listen to your pastor. I'll never apologize for trying to reach more people. I mean, if you want to second guess my motives, that's up to you. But every number is a soul that Jesus died for. And I don't want transfer. I don't want to steal somebody from somewhere down the road. I want to see unchurched, dechurched, and dischurched people. People that are dislodged. People that have fallen through the cracks. People that are, that are in between. 
people that have been damaged or wounded. Those are the kind of people I want to reach. And I'm asking, on that cross, one of my miracles, I want to see 400 people in this place. I want to, I want to reach 100 new people for the kingdom. Why did they take the time to count? You know, Mark doesn't say it, but Matthew does say it. It was 4,000 men, which we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It's 4,000 men. That means there's 4,000 women. The average uh, size of a Jewish household at that time was four kids. So we have 4,000 men, 4,000 women, 4,000 kids. That's about what, 12,000? Did I get that right? 12,000 people. Why take the time to count the crowd? Do you know, I think one of the most important things that we can sometimes allow happen in our life is when we, when we lose our sense of awe of what God does. You know, when I first moved to Roanoke 28 and a half years ago, you know what I loved? Do you know what I was in awe of? The mountains. Because I'm from Indiana. We call Ant Hills Mountains in Indiana. Nothing but flat cornfields. And when I came, I could not take my eyes off the mountains. I absolutely loved them. I don't watch the mountains anymore. They're just as majestic, just as beautiful. But after 28 and a half years, I've lost my sense of awe. I hardly see them anymore. I doubt if any of you do. We take for granted that we live in one of those beautiful places on the face of the earth. That same kind of thing can happen with the Lord. You know, we can, we can take for granted a good thing that we've had after a long time. We just always assume it's always going to be there. God does a great thing, and God does another great thing, and God does, and we just we begin to lose our sense of all of what God does and who God is. One of the first Christmases that I had here in Roanoke, back when the church was much smaller than it is today. Kath and I had an open house. Uh, we had three in a row for three different age groups of the church. We had, uh, the first night we had the 20 and 30 years olds, the young marrieds and the young marrieds with children. The second uh, age group was the 40 and 50 year olds. Back then that would have been like Ira and Joanne and Tommy and, jo and Joyce and Dick and Sue, uh, about the 40 or 50 year olds. And then the last night we had the 60, 70, 80, had come more like the senior citizens. That would have been, some of you wouldn't, would not recognize these names, but uh, Brother Hunley and Hallie and O.B. and Dorothy Cook, Elmer and Sylvia, they're all in heaven. Would have included Walter and Helen, Helen's in heaven. I don't know if you guys remember that. It's been a long time ago. But with every group, we ask the same question. What's your favorite Christmas memory? And we would have them in our living room. They have a big circle. And we had probably about uh, 20, maybe a little more, each night in every one of those groups. And we went around the circle the first night with the 20 and 30-year-olds. You know what we heard? We heard all about Christmas presents. The Chatty Cathy's and the G.I. Joe's, which were big when boomers were children. And our first bikes and all that. That's what we talked about. That's what stood out in our memories. The next night with the 40 and 50-year-olds, we asked the exact same question, went around the circle. You know what we heard? We heard about fellowship, relationship. And people talked about, I remember when we used to go to Myrtle Beach together. I remember when we used to go to Grandpa's. I remember when we used to go to Pigeon Forge. We all gather in, you know. They talked about the fellowship and the food and the relationship kind of stuff. And then the last night, with the senior citizens all in circle, asked the exact same question. I will never forget what O.B. Cook said. He came to O.B. and he said, I remember one Christmas back in 1936. There was this beautiful snowfall. And I said, say what? You remember a snowfall in 1936? Try the snowfall we had last year in Indiana. That I mean, it's not a dream. It's a nightmare, you know what I mean? You, you think of snowfalls as a, you know, a big Christmas thing? 
But that's what he would remember. That was his sense of awe. It was a beautiful snowfall. My generation, the boomer generation, I think we've lost our sense of awe. I think the Gen Xers and the millennials have fallen in right behind us. You know, when I was a kid, there were people that still lived in the horse and buggy days. And there were very few telephones. You know that I, I knew what it was to have one of the first TVs in my neighborhood? We put men on the moon. We were the ones that brought in the supercomputers. Even in my day, we could travel around the world in one day if you got in the right jet. Let's face it, boomers, it, we're just not that impressed anymore. It takes a little harder to impress our generation than it does Walter's generation. We've lost our sense of awe. And here's the thing when you carry that into spiritual realm. This is the thing that will kill us spiritually, guys. When God does great things and we don't take the time to marvel what he does, do you know what that will do to us spiritually? We will lose our sense of who God is. Right now, every person in this room has a little convenient box that you have God in. Some of your boxes are bigger than others. But every one of us has a box. This is who God is. And every now and then, God will do something that goes beyond your box. And you discover you've got to get a bigger box because God is bigger than that. If you don't take the time to marvel what God is doing in your life, you will have the same size box for the rest of your days. And that will affect your ability to worship him and to praise him because you don't even know who he is. If I didn't have laryngitis, I would have preached that a little loud. The third thing that happens after this miracle, they measure it, they marvel it. You know what they do after that? That's absolutely critical for you to do. They move on. They don't camp there. Look at verse, the latter part of verse 9 and, and then verse 10. It says, after, after he had sent them what? Come on, you guys are kind of quiet. You, I think you guys have laryngitis. After he had sent them what? There's my guys. There's my crowd. He got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. You know what can happen when you ever, you ever be in a time where God just really shows up and he just blows us all away and his presence is so keen and maybe there's some healing and some people getting saved. And You know, the presence of God is so sweet that you know what you tend to want to do? You know what you tend to want to do? You want to camp there. You just want to stay there. Just kind of circle the wagons around that thing. Because you don't want to move on. When you don't move on, you lose something that's absolutely critical. You know what it is? Your sense of where God is because God's not there. God has moved on. And you're still back there, reliving the past. It was good, it was great, but that's yesterday. And God calls you today and to tomorrow. You're not allowed to camp there, no matter how wonderful the miracle was. I want to show you a verse. It's in 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings 18, 4. Listen to this. Don't look it up. Just listen to it or put it on the screen. I, I forget if I gave it to you guys or not. But this is what it says. Hezekiah removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. You know what's going on? You know Hezekiah was a good king. And revival's coming. And it's spreading across the country. And he's tearing down all the idols. And it's an exciting time, right? It's an exciting time. But listen to this. Listen to the second half of this verse. Uh, he broke into pieces the bronze snake 
that Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Do you remember the golden snake that Moses put on that stick? Remember when they were trying to get to the promised land and they were infested with poisonous snakes and people were getting bit and some were dying and God told Moses to put this gold serpent on this snake and lift it up and anybody who saw the snake would be healed. It's the same image that's on the the Roanoke Memorial, uh, outside of the Roanoke Memorial Hospital. That was a great moment, a lot of healing. God showed up. The only problem was that was several hundred years ago. And now they, there's a segment of their, their society that's been hovering back there and remembering what God did. And, and you know what happens when you just camp at a place in the past where God visited? You start worshiping the event, the event instead of the, the inventor of the event. And that's what they've done. They've started worshiping that stupid golden serpent. And something that was wonderful has become a sin because they haven't moved on. Hezekiah comes and he breaks that thing, destroys it. Some of us have had wonderful miracles of the past. And we want to give God his credit and marvel. But we don't want to live there. God calls us on. had an interesting experience six months ago when Alicia gave birth to her second son. You know, one of, the, one of the cards on here that's mine is one of the biggest miracles God gave me as he spared my daughter. Three emergency surgeries in one day. Lost 22 units of blood. She shouldn't have been alive. And God saved my kid. She got pregnant a second time. When she announced it, I was scared spitless. You guys were there, Mark and Carolina, and everybody else is rejoicing. I'm sitting there kind of taking a deep swallow because I'm still getting over what almost happened. And it's time to deliver, and we go, we make the same trip we made the first time. And it's the first time we've been back to that hospital since that fateful day. And you know what we did You know what Kath and I did? We went back to the waiting room. And I looked at the chair that I sat in for three hours. And we went to the very room where that's the, uh, uh, it's not the delivery room, it's the room they take after the delivery. And uh, that's where we spent half the, about three quarters of the day. We went to that room and I remember, I remember almost every conversation. I remember, in fact, I walked down the hall to a room that was empty that night. It happened to be empty again that afternoon. I went, that was the room I went to where I had to find a place for it to be just me and Jesus. And I stood in that room and I remembered what I, how I was feeling and all the emotions. We went up to the ICU. That's where she went after the last surgery. And the doctor said, if she's alive at 3 o'clock, she's had, she has a chance. Now, we couldn't go into that, that room. It was occupied, but we could see through the, the glass windows. That's where I paced back and forth. That's where I coached, and that's where I cried, and that's where I prayed. The first time I'd seen it, I, I looked at the chair the doctor was sitting in who told me that. If she's alive at 3 in the morning, she has a chance. And I could hear those words again. And I was reliving it, see. I was reliving all of it of two years ago. But we couldn't stay there. Do you know why? Because there was a new blessing on the way. See? I don't want to live back there. I'd miss the new blessing that was on its way. And you know, the second go-around was much radically different than the first. God showed up in a different way the second time than he did the first. I didn't want to live in the past. I would have missed Fisher, my youngest grandson, because I was in a different place mentally and spiritually. Does that make sense to you? 
Some of you are back there. And God is calling you up. Some of the victories that you remember so fondly, they're too far back there. God has new victories for you. Did you just hear your pastor? I'm telling you that your God has new victories for you. It's not all just five years ago. It's here and now. God wants to do miracles now. You do not have permission to camp back there and die. God calls you to higher ground. God calls us to higher ground. Are you with me this morning?